branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain with me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is my Father's glory, that you wish, oh, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey me and my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Mile. David and I have a little inside joke. He doesn't like the passages as much about farmers and stuff because he just doesn't really. He likes video games and movies, but farming's not really his thing. So I was really excited when I told him, asked him if he would read this <coughs> passage, and he said yes. And I said, well, it's about farming. He said, no, it's not. He said, it's about relationships. And I was like, you got that, brother. So let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for the opportunity to come here and worship you. Father, I pray that your spirit is in this place today. Father, that he is working in the lives of each one here. And Father, I pray that your words just become clear to us. And not only do we hear them, Father, but we put them into practice. Father, may we be the kind of Christians that are described in Acts. Father, that love one another and spread that light out to this world. And Father, I just pray your blessings upon today, upon this service and each one here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a few weeks ago, Sherry and I attended the Free Methodist Experience, and it was based on John 15. Um, Children, you may be dismissed to Children's Church. Sorry about that. And we were supposed to write a uh, critique or something on John 15, 1 through 16, and I decided we would just preach on it. We can all take benefit of it. It was a good class that we went to. Um, Some things I learned that I had not seen before for sure, but it was just a great time of fellowship to know that there are Christian brothers out there in our denomination that support and love this church, that we're not alone. We are part of the Free Methodists. So basically today I want to go through this scripture at first and talk about it. In John 15 verse 1 it says, I am the true vine. Well, a vine is something that is intentionally planted. It's not just growing out there, in this case, because it talks about the farmer. And it applies more that it's in a vineyard. You plant that vine so that it will grow and produce fruit. And Jesus was deliberately planted here on earth so that He could be the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. That He was the Word living. That we can see through His actions how that we should be. And that He can present the gospel to us. And the fact that He came as redemption for us, that He would die and shed His blood for our atonement of sin so that we wouldn't have to. It was God's fulfillment of His plan to show us how much He loved us. He loved us in spite of all that we did to rebel. A holy, just God. Just think of it this way. If we lived in a, in a land where we had a king or nobleman that we had an answer to, And we said, no, I'm not going to do this. Or he said, don't go pick fruit off this tree and eat it over here. And we did. What would probably happen to us? We'd probably be locked up in the stockade. We might be killed. Who knows? But God loves us so much. He had every right to do that and so much more because He is a sovereign God. 
But he said instead, I love you. I love you so much that I will send Jesus Christ, my son, to this earth to die for your sins. We didn't want it. In fact, his, his immediate disciples turned their back on him. When the tough got tough, they left. They didn't stay with Jesus. They turned their back on him. But Jesus still knew what his place was. He obeyed the Father's commands. And he died for us. He died so that we could be reborn again, so that we could have life through him and that we could have life abundantly. We're not just supposed to sit there. We're supposed to grow and produce fruit. Jesus is the true vine and only salvation comes through him. If you're rooted or grafted into anything else, you're missing the point. Jesus Christ is where we're going to find life. Verse 1 goes on to say, And my father is the gardener. Some say that it's a good gardener. The King James Version says husbandman, which is the proprietor of a vineyard. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Not only are we supposed to produce fruit, but we're supposed to produce an abundance of fruit. Again, if you have a vineyard, your goal is to produce the most succulent grapes that you can produce. It's to produce many grapes. You don't want to be produced, have a few vines that are producing and a few vines that aren't. You want a garden that is productive. And that's what, what we're supposed to do as a church. Our purpose, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, is to bear fruit. And apart from that, we cannot bear fruit. It's a development process. It's not something that happens overnight. When you become saved, you don't just stop sinning. Paul said many times that why did he do the things that he chose not to do? His heart was right, but he still fought with the sinful desires of the flesh. And we're the same. We're no different. But we should be growing. We should be producing fruit. And fruit cannot develop apart from Jesus Christ. We have to be truly grafted in and rooted into that vine. I've said before, what would Jesus do? That's a great slogan. But I look at more, what did Jesus do? Because that's what we should pattern our lives after. We've got the Word made flesh and lived among us. We can look at His actions, His deeds. We can look at His words. And so many times we want to look at His words and say, well, that's a great suggestion. When it's boldly right in front of us that it's not a suggestion, it's a command. And this passage says it several times. And not only did Jesus Christ live an example for us, when He left, He said, I have to leave so that the Comforter can come, that the Spirit of God can come and dwell inside of you. God knows that we can't do it on our own. We can't produce fruit apart from the vine. So He gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us so that when we do struggle out there with things in life, we can let go and let God do it. We have God residing inside of us. So we should produce fruit. Well, what kind of produce, fruit should we produce? In the King James Version in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says these are the fruits... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, this isn't something that you go and pick and choose what fruit you want. This is a conglomeration of one fruit. Let me see if I can do this. It's like having there's nine, right? Bananas, mangoes, papayas, strawberries, apples, oranges, grapefruit, kiwi. Did I say kiwi? I don't think I said kiwi. And cherries. Cherries are sweeter than tomatoes. It's like having all of them as one fruit, one succulent fruit. You're not supposed to just produce love and not produce peace. You can't have it that way. We're a fruit that is a combined fruit of all of those spirits, of all of those fruits of the spirit. They're given to us through the spirit. You're fooling yourself if you produce one or two or eight of these and don't produce the ninth one. You're not grafted into the vine. You're not letting the Spirit of God rule in your life and give you the fruit that you want to. It's not a pick and choose. We are supposed to, as Christians, produce all of that combined fruit. Now, we might produce a little bit more of one fruit than the other fruit. That's possible. But there should be evidence of all the fruits in our lives. Plain and simple, if we're grafted into that vine, that's the type of fruit that we should produce. And if we're grafted into the vine, then not only can we produce fruit, but we can produce an abundance of fruit. Fruit that will sow seeds that other people will hear the gospel message and hopefully be drawn to Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about Gideon. 
And it's so amazing how God puts all these things together. Because Gideon is a perfect example, and it just happened at the perfect time that we had the Gideons come. Gideon was a man, when we first seen him, he was not a mighty warrior of faith. But we read about him in Hebrews as being held, held right, accounted as righteous because of his faith. He made what I call the Hebrews, and a lot of people call the Hebrews, Hall of Fame for his faith. Well, when we first see him, he didn't have any faith at all. He was making food, hiding and cowering from the enemy. And then the angel of the Lord came to him and said, Mighty warrior. And he's like, Who are you talking to? You're not talking to me because I am the, from the weakest clan and I'm the smallest of my family. I'm no mighty warrior. And he's right. But God sees the heart. God knew what Gideon was at his heart. And it took a lot of convincing. Gideon had to, in fact, go down to the enemy camp and hear the dream and the interpretation of the Midianites. I think I said Gideon went to the Gideon camp, did I a minute ago? I'm not sure. He went to the Midianites, not to the Gideonites, if I said that. <coughs> kind of tongue-tied. He went to the Midianites and heard them talking, and he, sa- he heard them say that they were going to be defeated by his hand and by God's hand. That's what it took for him to get that, ah, moment. Wait a minute. I'm not God. God is God. He is the one that's in control. And when He asks me, when He tells me to do something, why in the world am I being disobedient? So many times we put God into our frame of mind. God is not someone to be put into our frame of mind. God is God. What He desires and wants should be our ultimate goal and our purpose for life. But we say, God, when I get this accomplished, I'll do what you want. When you empower me enough, God, I'll do it. I'm proof of that. I have no training in the Word as far as going to seminary or anything like that. But I am up here preaching the Word of God boldly, whether you agree with it or not agree with it. That's God working through me. That's an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it should be obvious because He uses weak people like me and like Gideon to do mighty things. And I just want to be a part of that. And I want all of you guys to be a part of that. Gideon listened and he acted by faith. But faith sometimes we have is misguided, like we learned about in the different types of soil. If we have rocky soil, we don't have enough faith. If we have thorns and weeds in, a lot of times you don't even know what the truth is because the weed disguises itself so much that it looks like the truth. But we put our faith into other things. And many times we don't put our faith into things that we think are so awful because we're Christians. We don't put our faith into drugs to take care of our needs and stuff. But we do put faith in ourselves that I can take care of this. I can provide for my family. You can't provide for your family. Only by God's grace can you get up and function at your job and provide. Only by God's grace do you have that job. It's nothing that you do. It's all by God's grace. And we don't realize that so many times, even in the best of motives. And we put ourselves as God above the true God. Our purpose in this passage says that we are to bear fruit. We are part of that vine. And we're to bear all of those fruits. It's a privilege, I've said that before, and an honor to be a part of God's plan. He doesn't have to use us. He doesn't need us. He wants us. The God of all the universe wants someone weak like Gideon or myself to do his bidding. He wants every one of you to be fruitful. He didn't make that call to just the disciples. He made it to all Christians. In verse 3 it says, You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Once you believe, you've been set free. You have freedom instead of slavery. Freedom to serve and worship God or not. Freedom to have life instead of death. But you still have a choice. You can choose to serve God like Caleb did with all of his heart, or you can choose to serve Him half-heartedly like, Sam, like Solomon. And hopefully you don't find out at the end of your life that it's too late and you put your faith in all these other things. Hopefully you put your faith 100% wholeheartedly in God. And it goes on in verse 4 to say, Remain in me and I will remain in you. We have that promise. He won't forsake us. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. 
Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The NIV version might be a little clearer. It says that the fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I don't know about you, but I do struggle with some of them. Definitely. The self-control one? Oh, yeah. But I do see changes in my life when I let God take control instead of me. I do see that next time I have a little more self-control. When Jacob hit about 14, I had no self-control. He wanted to hit me, I wanted to hit him back. I wanted to see that he bled. That's what I wanted to do. And then God got a hold of me and said, what are you doing? You're driving him away. All the things that you're teaching, you're being a hypocrite. You need to love him. You don't need to stop being a parent and let him run over you. But you need to show him what is right and loving. Because when he sees you acting that way, he sees you as a hypocrite. And I saw fruit starting to develop when I realized that and let go and let God. Was it hard? Oh, yes, it was hard. Thank goodness I had a little woman would get in between us. But we have a much better relationship now. And in fact, now sometimes he says, I remember some of those things you said. And I'm trying to think, was it when I was hitting you? (laughs) So, you know, we all have to grow. Gideon is that perfect example of that. And we're to grow to bear fruit. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Not only fruit, but much fruit. There's the secret. We've got to be grafted into that vine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know about you, but I would like to, to, if I'm going to have fruit, I'd like to have much fruit. I'd like to be a success. And not a success in this world's eyes, but in God's eyes. So that when I do reach the judgment throne, yes, I have to stand account for every idle word that I've said. But also, hopefully I can see that he was proud and said, well done, my faithful servant. And that's how I want to live my life, and that's how I hope we live our life as a church. In verse 6, it says, If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on what this verse means. We could debate it left and right what that means. But plain and simple, take it for how you look at it in your own yard or your garden. If there's a broken limb or broken limb off a plant in your yard, and especially coming time towards winter, what do you do? You pick it up and you discard it because it's worthless. I don't know what that means exactly about being thrown into the fire or anything else, but I know that that limb was dead. Life apart from the vine is death. There is no life. And it is discarded because it is worthless. So you can debate whether you're going to heaven or hell or anything else, but if you live a life apart from the vine, you are living a worthless life that has no meaning, has no purpose. God created you for His purpose, for His glory. And when He saves you, He called you to produce fruit. If you're not doing that, you're a worthless, dead limb that should be discarded. Faith is the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Where is your faith placed? Only complete confidence in Jesus Christ and in God can you do what He wants you to do. Can you produce those fruits? It is tough. He knew it. That's why He gave us His Spirit. God can handle everything. There's nothing too big that God can't handle. you just got to let Him do it. You've got to be willing. You've got to lay those burdens down to Him instead of trying to take care of them on your own. You can't change anyone. You can't make anyone do anything. You can't take the pains and hurts in your life away. But if you give them to God, He can handle them. And then you can have peace. You can have joy. And instead of being bitter and angry... You can produce the other fruits. I had to do the same thing, like I said with Jacob. I had to give it to God that he would take care of him. I couldn't change him. Getting into a fist fight with him is not forcing him to, do my, to abide by my ways and my rules. As a matter of fact, it made him the exact opposite. But I thought, when I thought under my own logic, that, well, if I just whoop him enough, I'll set him straight. But that's not the way it works. Gideon is an inspiring example of that. He gives us hope. What did he do? He listened to God, and even though God's plans sound ludicrous in our mind, 
He gathered 10,000 men. God said, that's too many. He dwindled it down to 300. And he chose 300 men that lapped water up like dogs. Now, what is that saying? Did he take the most 300 ridiculous men that we could find? I don't know. But he took 300 men and faced 100 and I believe 35,000 Midianites. And he said, okay, now we're calling in you to battle. All right, let's go. Where's our armor? Well, take a clay pot. What? Take a candle and a horn and let's go fight. Now, would you want to sign up for that army? I wouldn't. But Gideon had faith. He had that aha moment. He didn't have it at first. It was a progress. And when he reached it, he said, I am going to do that. And if you read the passage in Judges 7, it says the men followed him. They saw that leadership and they followed him. And they faced the Midianites. And what happened? They turned upon themselves. They took the swords upon themselves. Who would have thought that's how God would handle it? But they were obedient. And they did. And then they, the land of Israel had 40 years of peace under the reign of, of Gideon. All because they put their full faith and trust in God. Not in themselves. Not in anything else. Even when times were bleak. They were held up in... in uh, Caves in the mountain and stuff like wild animals. They, they couldn't do anything. They had to hide their food to survive. And God rescued them from that because of their faith. Faith is the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Verse 8 goes on to say, This is my, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If we bear fruit, not only are we being obedient, but we bring glory to God the Father. We show that, he, that we are His disciples. Do you want to bring disgrace to God instead? Because that's what the opposite of bringing honor to Him is. So if you're not bearing fruit, are you bringing Him disgrace instead of honor? It says here clearly that it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Why would we try to fit God into our schedule? Why would we make time for God when it's convenient for us? He asks us to bear much fruit to bring Him glory, which He so richly deserves. Because He is God, and because He also loved you enough to, to send Jesus Christ to pay penalty of your sins, so that you would not have to die and spend eternity in hell apart from Him. Verse 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in His love. I've said it before, love is everything. If it wasn't for love, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for love, we wouldn't be redeemed. If it wasn't for love, we wouldn't go out and love others. How can you leave the last part out? How can you say, well, I'm fine, I'm saved, but I don't have to love my neighbor because I just don't like him. I can't stand them. I don't like that they do this to me. And because they did this to me, I have a right. You have no right. God tells you, to love one another. Not love some, but love all. Verse 11 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And he goes on to say how that is in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So not only are we supposed to love and and. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 gives us those ideas. When we get married, we think better or worse is an idea again. We think that, well, when times are bad, I'll just leave. That's why divorce is so rampant. When times are bad, you're supposed to love even more. Because then they'll see your love and they might change. And in the case of being a Christian, they'll see your love and hopefully it draws them to Jesus Christ. We want to love when people love us. Well, that's easy. But it is hard to love someone that despises us or does bad things to us. But God commands us, as Jesus said here, to love as He had loved, which meant that you love enough to lay down your life for your friend's salvation. The other things that you have in your life are not more important than that person's soul for all of eternity. Jesus commands it. And he says in verse 14, If you are my friends and do what I command, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. We're friends with Jesus. 
He made God's plans, the mysteries, known to us. It's clear. What is not clear is how you're going to respond to those commands. We tend to pick and choose what we want to follow. And then we sit back and think that we're doing everything right, that we're reading our Bible, we're praying, we're coming to church. But if we harbor hatred and resentment in our hearts, then are we following His commands? Are we producing the fruit that we're supposed to be producing? We deserve eternal punishment, but instead God gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ because Jesus was willing, He loved us enough that He laid down His life. Not only for His friends, because He was being spit and mocked and tormented, but He laid down His life for His enemies, and we're supposed to do the same. God appoints us to the task of bearing much fruit. In verse 16 it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Appoint means to choose someone for a particular job, to give someone a position or duty, to make it official, to officially designate and establish someone to carry out the task. And the person who gives the authority has every right and every authority to do so, to empower them to do that task. So verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. To do what? To bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. It's pretty clear. We've been appointed. We have a job. Whether we're obedient or not, it's a different story. But we have a purpose. Our purpose is to produce fruit. John 15 describes what a Christian life should be like. It should be deeply rooted in the vine of Jesus Christ so that we can produce fruit. You can't do that if your soil is rocky. You can't do that if your soil is thorny and full of weeds. You have to make yourself right with God. You have to let Him. You can't do it. So making it right doesn't mean I've got to accomplish this or that. I've got to get myself straightened out before I start doing these things. It means you need to be obedient and humble yourself and let God live through you in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you think that you're doing that and you think that there wasn't church mentioned in this passage, then you're missing the point. And I'm so glad you said that, David. All of the branches are connected to the same vine. This branch over here can't produce fruit and this branch over here not. It's not a healthy plant. All of the branches are grafted into the same for the same purpose of producing that fruit. So you can't say, I'm doing my part, but I'm not going to worry about my brother over here because he's offended me. We have to love one another. That's why Jesus closed out the passage with it. It's clear that to produce fruit, you've got to love one another. In verses 9, 10, 12, and 17, it tells you to love other people. Verse 9, it says, now remain in love. Verse 10, it says, remain in love. Verse 12, it says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And in verse 17, it closed with, this is my command, love each other. If that's not clear enough from the passage, in four verses, it tells you that it's a command. In verse 10, it says, If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in His love. Verse 12 says, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Verse 14 says, You are my friends if you do what I command. And then he closes out the passage again with, This is my command, love each other. It's pretty clear. But it's hard to do, isn't it? I'm just as guilty. I've struggled with it my whole life. But you know what? When I do lay that down, I have peace. Because I couldn't change that person that offended me. I couldn't do anything 